cake. You want to make a start then? Right. Well, hello everyone. I'm going to have to start by thanking Nikki for basically bringing me out of Perda and back into the big wide world. And in this picture you're looking at, in fact, you're looking at my home where I've lived for over 50 years in Gampton. And my life has been very closely associated with the dart, the dart estuary, yes, that we're going to be talking a little bit about this evening, but also right up onto the moorland itself as well. And as a teacher at Dartmouth of geography and history, this is probably where I really began to have my eyes opened, even though I'm a native. And probably you could say this is where I began to really fall in love with the environment. And that's why I'm so delighted to be able to come along and cheer for South Devon AUNB and all the work that Nikki and her friends do on our behalf. Now, because of time, I've decided that I want to start our little journey upriver from this particular spot. And off you go. Right, we're having to get, get to know this system. So you'll have to excuse me just a little bit to begin with. Hopefully we'll speed up. I would say that my philosophy that's developed over my life has been that love of environment is very much like marriage. And initially, for both, it's those exciting years, and I jest not when I say that, of learning about life, about your partner in marriage, obviously, exciting things in sharing your lives together and then going out and exploring the environment that is about you in walking and reading and talking with other people and broadening your whole experience and then as you move on into the later years of life love changes and yet, as far as environment goes, it changes also. You're no longer quite as the, the young deer able to walk up hills at an incredibly fast rate. You have to slow down. But I would say to you, certainly in my case, that my love of my environment around me has matured to an incredible depth to such a way, in fact, that it's really quite difficult, I think, I expect many of you agree, that it's difficult to accept change and how important it is to see that change is managed. And therefore, one of the major reasons for the importance of the AONB. Well, here you're looking across the Ditsum Pool towards Gampton, and I took this photograph, oh, it's certainly 25 years ago when I was walking the, the dark trail, very often leading a group, but then to be able to turn and look back on this extraordinary place that we call home, this wonderful combination of water and woodland and open fields, and there in the distance, Tor Bay, and the conurbation of 130,000 people, cheap by jowl. Now, the experiences we get from around here, this part, what we call Greenway, and this photograph I took from Greenway Garden, I was a, a volunteer there when the National Trust first took Greenway over. And therefore I had that lovely 
ability to be able to come down here for sorts of hours. This was early morning in the autumn, looking across from the Greenway side to the Raleigh estate. And then the extraordinary scenes of beauty and the tranquility that then come together to give one of those experiences that you never want to forget. And there you see the anchor stone marked at high water. And now that we've come down to water level pretty well, and we're looking upstream, the tide has fallen a bit and the anchor stone has come into view and there beyond the village of Dittisham or Ditsum as it's so often referred to. And just this one little rock that actually marks the boundary of the deep water. This side close to us, up to 80 feet in depth. The last area really of, for useful deep water anchorage. And once you pass the anchor stone, you're then into a different topography of the riverbed. Now it's wonderful to be able to get a bird's eye view sometimes, isn't it? And this in fact would be a present that I was given, a flight from Exeter over South Devon. And I can tell you literally I was on cloud nine, except there were no clouds. So these most beautiful views of our landscape below and this one of the river, of the estuary here at Greenway. On the right hand side, you have the promontory of Greenway. And we can see the beautiful meanders as the river or the estuary is making its way up towards Totnes. To the right, you've got the Gampton Creek. And compare the Dart Estuary with our neighbour, the Teen. And the difference is radical. And the difference is totally down to geology of sedimentary rocks interspersed with massive volcanic intrusion. Much harder resistant rock. So as the thousands of years have passed, hundreds of thousands of years, the drainage of the highland areas of Dartmoor, finding its way to the sea here, has had to meander its way around the hard and more resistant rock to give us this fascinating estuary, as compared to the straight dye of the teen estuary, where it's purely sedimentary Devonian, um, sorry, Permian rock that it's passing through. And the beauty of this place back in Tudor times would catch the eye of families such as the Gilberts, who would build the first residence here not the one you see in the picture in front of you now. This would be the replacement, the replacement Greenway house that would be constructed by Roop Harris Roop in the late 18th century. When he came here as an immig immigrant from Massachusetts with his wife and with a wife that would provide him with an incredible number of children, requiring that he built a much larger mansion for his family. And so that set for us this lovely Georgian house that we see today with an incredible background of history. And this is long before a lady by the name of Mrs. Malloan came along, better known as Agatha Christie.
part of that original construction also saw the building of a boathouse. Now I know I don't have any pointer to be able to um, help identify for you. But here you're looking at obviously Greenway, boathouse and bathhouse. The structure, the single story structure to the right was the boathouse, which was built in Tudor times, originally at the time of the Gilberts. And then it would be then later in Roop's period when taking the waters became very popular with the gentry. And so we have the bathhouse being added on where the ladies and gentlemen could take the waters for the good of their health. Because what was important wasn't the fact it was just water, that it was seawater. It contained salt. The whole concept of settlement around this area then that would be developing century by century would see following on from the roots the arrival of the Marwood Elton family and from an ancient trackway which we're going to be having a little look at in a minute the Eltons would build a new road down to the Greenway Ferry. And off that new road, they would build their new drive leading up to the house at Greenway. And that was in 1824. And the Elton family, in fact, who were merchants, um, adventurers from Bristol, very wealthy and they were very much in the import business bringing in wine but also they would bring in shrubs and trees from far distant lands and it would be these that would then be planted to soften this fascinating estate and the camellia garden for instance originated at this time probably one of the most popular aspects of the garden that appealed to Agatha in her time in the 20th century. And from here, the lovely view down through the trees, this wonderful mix of native oaks and ash and imported timber here overlooking the river. and all the different vantage points that you get from this semi-wild garden from those days and now very beautifully managed by the National Trust, even during these hard times. Here, looking up from the battery up to Ditson. The pleasure that this river gives in so many different ways. And we have such things, of course, as wild swimming and uh, very much adventurous activities for the young. And yet, you see, the river can provide fascinating, enjoyable activities for people as we mature in life as well. Now climb up the garden at Greenway, away from the house and inland in an easterly direction. And you then get some of the most beautiful views of the dark estuary that I, I have ever come across. Here, we're still within the Greenway estate and we're looking down river to the port of darkness. And on the left, long wood and this extraordinary environment and I remember it was a time in my life when I was feeling very sad 
I had lost my older sister. This is over 20 years ago now. And feeling very demoralized, I just came on a very long walk. And I remember standing here and just looking at the beauty of South Devon. And that thought, I don't need to own this to enjoy it, to have love for the landscape. It is there, it is there for all of us and for us to guard it for future generations. Do you know, that has stayed with me ever since. The fact that you don't need to own something to enjoy it. Well, back down to water level here at the Green, Greenway Ferry. Winter time, and again, this photograph is about 25 to 30 years ago that I took this. Of course, it's changes that are taking place gradually. Sometimes we then forget what they once looked like, the subtle changes. And the Greenway Ferry Crossing is one of the most ancient crossing places of any river in this country. It goes back to primeval times, to the Bronze Age. So we're talking between four and 3,000 years ago. A little bit more of that in a minute. But from the Greenway side, we look across then at Ditsum, the landing place here, and then the hill rising up, rising up towards then a wonderful plateau area and we would be making our way towards Stanbra Beacon, which is very much the watershed of the Dart River itself. Now this river, of course, has been <laughs> draining the landscape for centuries, as I said before. And this lovely black and white photograph taken between the wars shows it very much still as a working river. The two vessels in the foreground, one you will probably recognize, the one nearest us, one of the Dart paddle steamers. In those days, acting literally as a bus service, carrying people from the towns of Dartmouth and Totnes, but also stopping off just to pick up or drop off people who might be wanting to visit the village of Ditsum or Stoke Gabriel. So a vital link for the community over the years. And here, this ferry is just passing a dredger, a sand dredger, by the name of Effort Two. And she was working out of Gampton in dredging sharp sand, river sand. And that sand was collecting in various places from Totnes down to this particular point. No further down than this, no further down than the anchor stone. And it would be then brought ashore at Gampton, but also at Totnes. And it was a very a good material. The name Sharp came from the fact that the origins of this sand is the granite of Dartmoor a hard rock that even when broken down, the particles are sharp edged and therefore very useful both in the horticultural trade, 
but also in certain aspects of building. Then you might notice further down river, you've got ships laid up in the, the Nos area. And this was during the Great Depression. And this picture I love. Yes, black and white photograph taken from Greenway Quay, looking across at Didsome back in those days. Notice no council houses yet. Literally still just a very simple fishing and trading village. And to the left on the waterfront, the salmon fisherman's cottage. Now, I wonder if any of you remember when the Ditson Ferry or the Greenway Ferry was actually a little car ferry. And here you see a young Roy Andrews who used to run the ferry here. Finally, this was given up in the 1970s, the late 1970s. And of course, these days, it's simply a small passenger ferry only. As I've said, times are always on the change. And with that in mind, here's that fisherman's cottage again. Now the earlier photograph I showed you of the fisherman's cottage, we have a wonderful real life story of the family who lived here and they were salmon fishermen and the rent they paid for this cottage was four pounds ten shillings per annum now when i took this photograph of that same cottage we're talking about 1998 and the rent has gone up to one and a half thousand pounds a week. Change? Very much so. Now we climb. We're climbing up above Greenway and we're on the ancient trackway. I'm going to initiate you to one end of the trackway and that is at a lovely little cove called Churston Cove on the very edge of Brixham and that cove used to be a landing place for Phoenician traders back before the birth of Christ and that trade route would then come from there across the plateau where then the village of Churston would later be developed and on up to the heights and down here and this photograph is taken from that ancient trackway before it descends down to higher Greenway farm and then on to the Greenway estate down then to the ferry crossing Having crossed the river, you then climbed up the steep slope through Ditsum and along the ridgeway. And you were on your way to the ancient administrative center of the South Hounds back in the Iron Age. And it would be this period when a place called Stanborough Beacon would come into being a whole conurbation of Iron Age fortifications, closely associated with the little village of Holwell. And it is the fact that you can still today walk that route from Churston Cove to Stanborough Beacon. And that is what I love about landscape that we find ourselves with today. 
the changes have happened to a certain extent, and yet we have this extraordinary gift of being able to look into our past and at a countryside that still shows thousands of years of its life. And even here, where the trackway crosses the fields, as you know, we have the seasons. And so in, that, in those four seasons, we will find this field changing from spring and planting to harvest in the autumn. And in the distance, there, where the dart rises, the beautiful upland area of Dartmoor. Now this photograph I took early morning, the mist still shrouding the valley floor and the river. This is Lower Greenway Farm. And it came into being at the time of the Harvey family who became squires of Greenway and the landed gentry during the, the mid Victorian era. A fascinating man. And just one little look into his character, which makes him such an interesting gentleman. The farms in those days, in mid-Victorian times, throughout South Devon, were built like fortifications, massive masonry. But here, at Lower Greenway, we have a chimney that stands up from the building because Richard Harvey was very much for modernization and he put in a steam engine to help improve the efficiency of his farms. And that chimney still remains with us today. The irony is that he loved his steam, but he could not abide railway steam. And the railway company, the Dartmouth and Torbay Steam Railway Company, wanted to bring the railway literally down across the middle of this meadow, down to bridge the Dart at Greenway across the Ditsum. And he fought it, and he won in the House of Lords. And an Act of Parliament was passed, thanks to Richard Harvey, that no bridge must ever be built across the Dart estuary below Totnes. And that regulation still stands. And if it hadn't been for that regulation, that act, I would have thought it would have been nigh impossible that we would not have seen three at least road bridges across the river by now. Well, a moment of tranquility. Gampton Creek, looking across at Didson, and just this weathered piece of timber that has washed up, having been just beautifully rounded by its time in the water. And Gampton Creek has been an industrial creek for many centuries, but really coming to a climax during the Victorian era. And here you see Gibbs Shipyard, and this is its timber stack. Timber that's been bought here to season before being cut and shaped to create one of the over 300 sailing vessels and fishing smacks that were built here over a hundred year period. And across on the other side of the creek, that is Cliff Cottage. I'm telling you how time moves on. Now you see, 
when I took this photograph again about 30 years ago, that's how it looked. Well, it's moved, it's changed, it is changing bit by bit. And yet somehow we're keeping its character. And at the head of the creek, the rails that you can see here, on which the steam grub used to chuff its way up and down, those rails are still embedded in this key surface. And there, to the right, is effort two. That's the sand barge being unloaded. And the Langmead family, who used to run it up until not long after the war, the Second World War. Well, Langmead Sand Landing Key is to the right of this photograph. And we're now looking out across at one of the old lime, uh, sorry, one of the old limestone quarries. And again, a photograph that I've taken many, many years ago, because of course, this is now very much part of a boat park and looks very different. But this quarry was being worked back in Tudor times. And we know of proof of limestone taken from here and used as ballast in vessels sailing out to Newfoundland for the cod fishery, where the ballast, the limestone ballast, would be offloaded and used to help to build parts of the keys of St. John's Harbour. And other of that limestone from this quarry was simply brought across from that little dock you see there on the far side, brought across to this side down by the roots of the tree and tucked in on this greenway side is just another one of the multitude of lime kilns that we find all the way up the Dart estuary. They're beautiful little structures, but they weren't just simply built to look beautiful. They were very much buildings of utility, there for a purpose. To create, first of all, quicklime, from which then fertilizer and sterilizer could be made to sweeten the soil on the acidic hillsides away from the limestones. And of course, quicklime, incredibly corrosive and dangerous to work with, and yet very valuable. You could then slake that quicklime, adding water extremely carefully. And with the slate lime, then you had the raw material for making lime mortar for your building or lime wash for lime washing your cottages. Now this picture is taken from a gate at the head of the creek, of Gampton Creek, this is known as Point Field, that you can just see a little bit of. Again, an early morning photograph, and we're looking upriver towards Totnes. And somebody else who loved this area and loved the views, and loved to capture the views here, before the days of photography, through art. And this was Frederick John Widgery's view of Ditson from Gampton Creek in 1920.
on up river and I get to speed up a bit because I know I'm beginning to talk a little bit <laughs> too much. The boathouses on the estuary and here at Waddington we have a landing craft from the war United States Coast Guard 10th flotilla and this was just prior to D-Day this particular landing craft had gone on to the rocks whilst doing a practice landing in Tor Bay doing landing practice landings with American GIs on the beaches at Preston so here she is having to be repaired before taking part in, of course, the great D-Day landings on Normandy. And that was to happen after all of the, largely the fields that you see in this picture would have been one huge, great big American encampment leading up to D-Day during the early months of 1944. This view looking down on the estuary really helps us to appreciate that our valley, the dark valley, the estuary is a drowned valley. A valley that drowns twice a day on the tide. And it's been doing this for the last 10,000 years. And the extraordinary links that we have of the river with the sea and men who went out from this part of the world to basically help to build the British Empire, whatever one's views are about empire. Well, it happened. And it was this little island called Britain that actually caused this to happen, which is so extraordinary. And here at Sandridge, this Georgian development is Sandridge Barton, the farm of Sandridge. In Tudor times, it was a much simpler little farmstead. And it was part of the estate of Adrian Gilbert. And here, the farmer's wife would give birth to a little baby boy who they were called John. And this was the birth of John Davis in 1543, around this spot. And John Davis would go on to grow up to be one of England's greatest navigators and chart makers before falling to Indonesian pirates in 1605. And you see, from the complexities of humanity and life, this picture, I remember when I took it on the river bank, the end of the life of a beautifully made timber structure, craft. And yet out of the death of that craft, a seed has taken and life has now come forth. And ingenuity and creativity that the human race has created, often hand in glove with nature. This is what we call Tor Woods Salmon Trap. This structure, this rather rough looking wall, was built under the instructions of the monks of Tor Abbey back in the 14th century. So that has been there since that time when Tor Abbey literally was an abbey. And Lady de Waddington, 
gave the canons, I should say, of Torabi this land, hence the name Torwoods. And this was to their payment for them praying for the soul of her departed husband. For well, the canons weren't ones to waste their assets. And so they created here a salmon trap. There would have been a gateway in this wall when the tide was making and flowing in with the water would come the sun. At high water, you then shut the gate and as the tide then went out, the water would percolate out between the rocks. But of course, the salmon couldn't fit between the rocks. And all you had to do then at low water was walk in to the, the bed of the trap and pick up the salmon. And the fact that it's still there for us to wonder on the ingenuity of man. But of course, as you know, we don't always get it right in the long run, sadly. And I was incredibly lucky and thankful to be able to take this photograph of two of the last of the salmon fishermen of the Dart here carrying out their trade that had been carried out by generations before them. And the place where much of this salmon fishing used to take place would be on this stretch of the Dart estuary, situated between Higher Dittisham, which is the village you see in front of you there, and out of picture to the right, the village of Stoke Gabriel. And there it is. I think what is important to see about this picture and the next one as well, this little village that once was part of the manor of Paynton, when Paynton was a small village. Now, Paynton has expanded and we see it like the enemy on the crest of the hill. Stoke Gabriel. And then this lovely old painting by William Payne showing the old water mills. And of course, all that remains is the, the foss, the, the dam that keeps the water in the creek behind. But once upon a time, that water on the falling tide would power these water wheels um, for grinding the corn. And in the distance, you can see the little church of St. Mary and St. Gabriel, very much part of its whole history of life in this little village. And here, the, the pool. Very popular spot, of course, these days for both locals and visitors, because of course it is so appealing in so many different ways. I think this picture probably more than many others shows the incredible importance though of the Dart Estuary. This is the boundary of development. The fact that Richard Harvey stopped the building of the bridge back in the 1860s and how important the management of landscape is here in the future of the South Hounds. And just up from Stoke, this lovely little Z bend in the river where it changes character. The Duncannon Reach 
and Ashbrington Point. And this photograph is taken, or was taken, on the track leading from the village down to Ashbrington Point, from Ashbrington Village down to Ashbrington Point. That tree no longer exists. Winter time, there this natural boundary, the river. To the left, Tor Bay, 130,000, expanding population. To the right, the ancient South Hounds. Long stream, the longest stretch of straight estuary from Dartmouth to Totnes. And then little Don Cannon, nothing like as pretty as it used to look, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm old fashioned. Because this is how it used to look when it was the ferryman's cottage here with the fisherman drying his salmon nets and waiting perhaps for the bell or the whistle to blow on Ashmington Point for him to go out and bring somebody across or the paddle steamer heaving to to let somebody off or take somebody on board. And don't you think this lovely little fisherman, um, sorry, the ferryman's cottage, it looks as though literally it has grown out of the ground itself. And the view from that fisherman's cottage at Duncannon would take your eye up, not to the head, but to the, the beginnings of this lovely Creek. And this is Bow Creek, a lovely eddy. Today, beautifully tranquil on the whole, wonderful wildlife, and yet in Victorian times, it was heavily industrialized as a little estuary port. And it certainly had grandiose ideas because this is Tuckenhay and this little creek that comes off at Tuckenhay, the little stream that feeds into the river here is nobly named the River Wash. And uh, I keep on forgetting that I can't use a pointer to point things out to you. <laughs> but if you look at the picture, on the very right of the picture, a small building in front of the thatch cottage, that was one of the very first gas works in South Devon, providing gas light, largely, for the building, we can just see a little, little bit of it above the thatch roof there, but we'll home on in it for you. The Tuck and Hay paper mill. And this paper mill brought an extraordinary amount of wealth to this part of South Devon because it would be high quality bonded paper that would be made here. And that bonded paper would be used then all over the empire, taken out by boat from the quay here. And this is high water, eight o'clock in the evening and a summer's evening, drifting down with the tide back down to Gampton. And the lovely trackway that takes you from here, up from the river, up from the creek, up to Cornworthy. And Cornworthy is over 200 feet above the river. 
and yet it is very much a village of the doubt. Of course, radically changed over the last 50, 60 years with changes in social structure, but it is still a very fascinating little village to come to. And the fact that back in medieval times, there was a priory here, Cornworthy Priory. And this was largely for the daughters of wealthy landowners who hadn't found husbands. And it was literally to be known that apparently they weren't that well behaved. And the Pope would write a letter to the ladies of Cornworthy, advising them to behave themselves. Isn't it wonderful that we still have the remnants of this gatehouse relating to that era in our past? And so back then down to the river, and of course the pleasure that it gives us these days the simplicity of sail, a means of mobility that has been handed down to us over the centuries. And it still gives immense pleasure for so many people. And the peace and tranquility and the means to study the wildlife. And the importance of Utilizing the seasons. I took this photograph in November on a downward journey from Totnes. Absolutely still day. But just the simplicity of the color, the water, and yes, the presence of man in navigation. Because here we're now heading up to Sharpham House. Constructed for Lieutenant Philemon Pownall, Royal Navy. The result of prize money from the capture of a Spanish treasure ship. Very sadly, he would never live long enough to be able to reside here but he certainly left a wonderful inheritance for all of the people of South Devon. And the fact that the house is built upon another promontory, a promontory that is another of those igneous intrusions, acidic rock, which provides a beautiful soil for the grape. And of course, the very situation of the river around it, providing rather like a water jacket, on the whole, keeping away the cold frosts of winter. And from Sharpen, if you're able to enjoy a lunch or a cream tea here, or to buy a bottle of wine from the shop, you can then look across the river to the east bank and Fleet Mill Quay. There, the quay, you can see behind the wreck, the quay, very old, and this was the landing place back in Norman times, when the Lord of the Manor of Berry Pomeroy, the de Pomeroy family, when they were coming from their Norman land holdings across to England, they would come by boat up as far here as here 
And this is where the de Pomeroy family would land and then take horse for the final leg of the journey up to Barry Pomeroy Castle and his estates up there. The ruin, the ship, is the Kingswear Castle. And she had been used in the First World War as a quarantine vessel, moored down off Dartmouth. And when the war was finished, it was thought that there were probably so many infections within the timber work that she was brought up river here, laid alongside Fleet Mill and torched. Well, destructive, yes, in one way, but in fact, she's made a wonderful habitat for wildlife. The associated village of the area, of course, is Ashbrington. And following the demise of the, the original Lord and Master, the Durant family would take over and be the laws of the manor of this area during Victorian times. And from Sharpham House and from the estate, I think one of the most beautiful views you can get of the upper reaches of the Dart, with the marshes and there in the distance, Dartmoor, and then the church of Totnes and the castle, and really a totally unspoiled scene. Now, something I've only relatively recently come across, and this has been thanks to the researches and the archives kept at Exeter. This is a, a very small version, I'm afraid, for you to, to see. This is a chart that was created by the Rennie brothers in 1832 at the instruction of the Duke of Somerset when they wanted to actually be able to accurately judge where improvements to navigation should be made along the length of the reaches of the Dart Estuary. It is the most stupendous chart, something like four meters in length and the accuracy of the readings that were taken quite extraordinary and it was from this that then the duke of somerset was able to get an act of parliament for the improvement of the navigation of the dart estuary to allow it to be dredged so that shipping could once again reach the port of Totnes. Another winter's view of the upper reaches. There you can just see in the distance, there the church tower. And as we get towards the finale, of this little journey. Do you know, when I took this picture, and this one is about 30 years old, never did I realize that this would become such a historic picture within my collection. Traders first started coming upriver to this settlement of what we call Totnes back in pre-Christian times. They have been coming and trading certainly for 3000 years. It would be in my lifetime that I would see the last of the trading vessels come to Totnes. Here, the timber, the Baltic Wharf timber ships 
being brought up river to the company of F.J. Reeds. And we've arrived at what is called Home Reach. What a perfect name, this last little stretch of river. As we arrive at Totnes, the original bridge here, well, in fact, it's not the original bridge. It's in the place of the original bridge. In fact, though, before those times, it would have been something like three times the length when the whole of the floodplain would have been underwater during high water or flooding. But the town of Totnes, the little Saxon town, as it would be, built high up above, way out of the reach of flooding, with its four gates. And here, the east gate that still remains, and a little town that was to become a major trading port, 10 miles inland. From its Saxon origin, then the arrival of William the Conqueror, and he would provide then to Judal, one of his knights, this particular manor, as one of his many manors given by the king, and the subjugation of the people here, the Saxons, with the building of the Norman castle and keep still remaining with us today. And from the walls of that keep, you really do get this wonderful picture of why it was built here, dominating the town and dominating the river, this highway of the water. from a trading port, bit by bit, it's changed from trade into a place of tourism and a very unique town, associating with many, many different styles of life today. But the conversion of wharves and warehouses I would submit has been done very tastefully within this original area of the waterfront. And so, finally, we take you all the way back down to Gampton. And this is the view at half past seven on an autumn morning. The moon is about to set and the whole of the valley floor is shrouded in a duvet of mist. And then come back eight hours later as sunset and the river has turned into a river of gold, reflecting the immense sanctity and beauty of this wonderful estuary and its surrounding environment. Thank you very much indeed, everyone.